Thank you all so much for joining us. We're so thrilled to have you with us this evening for the volunteer orientations for Wild Care's After Hours Emergency Line. A very, very important position at Wild Care, and it's, an, it's a position that gives you the opportunity to make a tremendous difference for both people and animals. And it really is one of the most powerful volunteer opportunities you would be, you're, you're gonna be able to find in terms of being able to really, really help and make a difference. So we're thrilled to have everybody interested. My name is Allison Hermans. I am the Director of Communications at Wild Care. I have been at Wild Care for 18 years. Um, we'll do our quick introductions and then we'll do a little run through about the organization for everybody that's not familiar. We'll do it really quickly. Go for it. Hi, I'm Melanie Piazza. I'm the Director of Animal Care and I have also been here for 18 years. Astonishingly enough. <laughs> Brenna? Oh, Brenna just stepped away. So we'll, we've got our volunteer manager as well. And so she'll be the ah, Here she is. Come on in. From the live studio audience. Live studio audience. Exactly. <laughs> Introduce Hello. yourself. Hi, my name is Brenna Malin. I am the volunteer and social media manager. I see some faces there. Thank you so much for joining us um, for this. I think I have a couple of folks on here that I recognize the names of. So for those of you new and um, uh recurring here for wild care definitely appreciate you coming um this is going to be probably what 30 minute uh orientation mm -hmm. just to give you some information about this position i'm hoping to correspond with many of you soon um i'm sure you'll hear from me a lot a lot of emails soon so um thank you so much for joining and um yeah you'll know where to find me exactly <laughs> thanks exactly. guys she's the one that answers the volunteer at discoverwildcare.org email so you'll hear a lot from her yeah yes thank you so wild care in case you're not familiar with this i know most of you got the information about the orientation because you are on our e our email list so i know most of you are familiar with us but we of course are a wildlife hospital nature education and wildlife advocacy organization located in Marin County. And Marin County is in Northern California. We're about 20 minutes north of San Francisco, depending on traffic. <laughs> We're about 20 miles from San Francisco. And Wild Care as an organization has been around in some iteration or another since the 50s. We were one of the first wildlife hospitals that opened in the entire country. And we treat between 33,500 and 4,000 injured and orphaned wild animal patients in our wildlife hospital every single year. We have a, the wildlife hospital, we have a very, very robust nature education program that takes, you know, field trip, does field trips for kids, takes our taxidermy animals and live animals, our educational animals to classrooms. We do a tremendous amount of advocacy. I was testifying in front of the Coastal Commission just this morning. And we also have our amazing hotline and emergency line. So the hotline is the is a staffed position that's here on site at Wild Care, admitting wildlife hospitals into the uh, wildlife patients into the wildlife hospital, and answering calls. And in the last year, we answered over fifteen thousand calls on the hotline, with another four thousand, maybe five thousand, being answered on the emergency lines. So it is a huge number of calls that are coming in. Welcome. Let's see, welcome to our late comers. Thank you for joining us. And just to clarify, when we say hotline, that's yeah. the phone we answer during our business hours, nine to five. Right. And then the emergency line or e-line is what you guys are training for. And that's after hours. Yeah, exactly. So we, for some reason, um, I guess it's my website. I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but we seem to be, when you do a search for uh, a wildlife rehabilitation hospital or wildlife care, we are one of the first things that pop up. So we get calls from all over the country and actually all over the world as well on the hotline and to a certain degree on the e-line as well. So it really is a tremendously valuable uh, service that we provide. Uh, certainly all of our programs. And one thing I love about Wild Care is that all of our programs really do work together as a full cycle of programs to help people navigate the boundaries where they're coming into contact with wildlife. And the whole goal of the work that Wild Care does is to help people live well with wildlife and to make the that interaction that you have between people and animals be as humane for the animals, as good for the animals, and, and also good for people. And that's one interesting thing about the volunteer position on the e-line is that you are very much helping animals and it is a very very tangible at the end of your shift you're like wow i saved a lot of lives this evening but you also really 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 helped people and you're making a big difference for people that care enough to rescue animals and so it's a it's super super valuable i will chip in there for a second and i do have to say that we say this during our um, regular volunteer orientation as well this is about people in the hospital, but also especially with what you guys are doing. 
And if you only like animals and you don't like humans, this is not the position for you. <laughs> like this is really, I don't know how many of you have actually rescued a wild animal, found an injured animal on your own, how insanely stressful that is. And it's for me and I work here. I literally right. have the keys to this building. And still, if I like find an animal hit on the side of the room, I'm like, ah, what do I do? Oh, you do you I do? Like stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're gonna deal, you're dealing with people who are in that situation, incredibly stressed out and worried. Um, and so this is a lot of just human care too. It's, it helps the animals, but it's a lot about the people. Yeah. So we've talked about a little bit about this already, but why is the emergency line such an important service? And, and it really is, it's that bridge between what we can offer with our hotline, which is open from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Pacific time, and what happens after hours, um, you know, once- When we're closed. When we're closed, exactly. And and everyone else is closed too. You know, one of the things about being on, on Cali in California is that, you know, we're one of the, you know, it's nine o'clock on the East Coast. It's all, it's it's only six o'clock here. So, you know, people finding animals at, at all hours of the night, both in the San Francisco Bay Area and, and across the country, they really are looking for a resource. And that's what the emergency line provides. And being able to staff it with qualified volunteers that have had extensive training. There is a lot of training. You also, you want to have a lot of skills coming into it, but there is a tremendous amount of training that goes into it. Having the phone answered by a person that knows what they're talking about and has a real ability to help is an unbelievable resource. And it is going to give you, like the slide says, the best outcome both for the animals and for the people. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting because we're, it's a tremendous amount of education. We're educating people on conflicts with wildlife. We're educating people on how to rescue. We're educating people on you know, what's an emergency and what isn't an emergency. And, and that's a tremendous number of calls that we get. You'll have someone in a complete lather about something and you'll talk them through it and be like, oh, actually that animal's fine. It's gonna be okay. Bonds are a good example. We'll talk about that in training. But then you have situations that are emergencies. You have animals that, you, that are injured. You have animals that have been separated from their families and need to be brought back together with their families. And you're the person that's going to be facilitating all of that. Um, one of my notes here is that the person who's calling on the emergency line has no one else. They are calling you because they are scared, they are desperate, and they have absolutely no idea what to do. And so you are stepping in as that person to give them the information that they need to not only save that animal's life, but to also make it an experience that's good for them. I get it. Oh, go ahead. She's got it. Excellent. Um, one other thing, I mean, there's many things that we end up doing, but another thing that I have in my notes is that if you are a hotline operator, an e-line operator, you're also mitigating the harm that people do to animals. You're there to help people, again, navigate that boundary where people in wildlife are coming into contact with each other and just make that fluid, make that easy, make that humane and make a real difference for both the people calling and for the animals. Let's see, where's my, why are we not progressing? There we go. We might go to 10 slides and then come back. Let's hope we don't. Um, <laughs> I mentioned just a little bit ago during my introduction about how wild care is a whole cycle of programs that are all working together to help people live well with wildlife. And what I love about wild care is that our, all of our programs are humane, of course. Obviously, we're a wildlife organization. We care about animals. They're respectful and they're also practical. And I think that that is something that our emergency line operators really kind of get a feeling for of what is the practical advice that I can give you right now that is going to help you rescue this bird, save him from whatever's going to happen to him, make it easy on you know yourself and him having him overnight before you have to bring him into wild care in the morning or whatever the situation is. That, that practical, pragmatic, okay, here's your problem, let's solve it for you. And again, Wild Care's programs approach that from lots of different directions, whether it's the wildlife hospital, bring him in, nature education programs, let's learn about animals so they don't get injured in the first place, advocacy, obviously. But the E-Line really is that, that real hands-on moment of you know practical, pragmatic, let's do the right thing for this animal and let's do it together. So um, let's see, do you have anything else on there? No. All right, no. go girl. <laughs> no, my turn. It's you. Okay. Um, so the, all the things you're going to want to know what you're going to be doing and what you're expected to do. Um, so your role as a, a volunteer on the E-Line. So one of the great things about this is if or any of you have been to our orientation or looked up our orientation for the hospital, 
that is a huge time commitment where you have to come in for a four hour shift on site um, the same day every every week for nine months. Um, it makes sense because you're helping animals in the wildlife hospital. Right. Um, but a lot of people can't do that um, physically. And this is the way that a lot of people can help that couldn't maybe make that um, make that commitment. So basically, especially now in the day and age of everybody having a cell phone, it's really easy um, to be on the E-line. So basically, um, deep couch sitting, we're joking. So this is a picture of our friend and coworker, Kate, on the E-line um, as we had dinner and drinks at a friend of ours house um, one evening. So you can still have a life. You do not have to sit by the phone and wait for it to ring and not go do anything. Have dinner with friends, go out. Um, the only thing you probably can't do is go to a movie because obviously you don't want to be that super annoying person who has your phone going off and in the movie theater all the time. Um, but other than that, you can still have a life while you're on call. The line is forwarded either to your cell phone or when you can log into an app and get calls that way. So it, it again comes to you wherever you are. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do not have to use your own phone and phone number, so the public right. will not have your personal phone number. Um, and don't ever give the public your personal <laughs> phone number. Yeah. I speak from experience, because <laughs> um, then they will call you every day, all the time, all hours for everything. Um, you're obviously going to be representing wild care, um, and so that's something to keep in mind throughout this presentation. And when different topics come up during training and things like that, that, you know, you may you may not have the exact same philosophy as wild care does. A good um, example of that is indoor cats. So wild care always talks about asking people to keep their cats indoors and have catios and leash train. You may have an outdoor cat, totally fine. We just ask that if the situation, the topic comes up, you are able to um, respect wild care's position and, and teach wild care's position on that topic. Um, we encourage tolerance, of course, um, and empathy. Those two are really, they can be hard because a lot of times your caller is very stressed and very upset and could be very mad um, and taking it out on you. Um, so knowing how to de-escalate situations, um, usually when you start helping them, they calm down a little bit. Um, but knowing that it's not about you personally and understanding where that person is coming from, how stressed they are. Um, and communication, um, or managing expectations. That's another really big thing we'll learn in training. Um, I, that's to me, managing expectations is huge. You don't, it's we don't. the hardest thing for me. It's the hardest <laughs> thing for concierge, Allison. Um, you have to go into it knowing our goal is to, of course, help all the animals we can, but it's also to keep as many animals out of our hospital as possible. We don't want to go, oh, yes, bring that fawn in. We'll take him in the morning. It's, well, no, you have to ask a bunch of questions. And like, is, is he okay? Are you kidnapping him? All of those types of things. So, what's right for the animal and also what's right for wild care staff that's already overwhelmed with the number of animals that we currently have in, in, in care. And also because we get so many calls from all over the country and internationally, um, managing expectations that way too. Like I literally got hung up on once by a woman in Texas who was so mad at me that she had called at like six in the morning and woke me up back. We used to have the E-line on all through the night, the entire night, um, and woke me up at like six in the morning and was so upset that we would not come up and pick up the deer that had been hit by a car in front of her house. And I kept trying to explain to her that we were in California <laughs> and she would not hear it and she hung up on me. Um, but managing expectations is a big thing too. So, and yeah. obviously helping wildlife. All right, so what kind of things are you gonna learn? Um, the biggest number one is whether or not an animal actually needs help. This is huge in the spring and the summer, what we call baby season, when all the babies in the world are fledging or growing um, and knowing whether or not a baby bird is actually just learning to fly and he should be left alone with his family or if like this little toey sitting in the picture is all fluffed with his eyes closed, that is a bird that does not feel well um, and would need to come in and we will teach you those skills um, and those things to learn. This process takes years. We will teach you and train you, but I am still, I've been doing this 25 years, I'm still learning stuff all the time. So um, every time I do a hotline or an e-line shift, I learn at least one new thing. Yeah. I, I learned just the other day that a hummingbird of any age should never be on the ground. Mm -hmm. If a hummingbird is on the ground, that is an animal that is in need of care and immediate rescue, right? Other birds like your toey, they're on the ground all the time. Yep. Um, species ID is going to be huge. 
Um, the, one of the best things with technology in the cell phones is having callers, we do this at the front desk all day and Elon sending pictures of the animal because somebody's version of a small little brown bird <laughs> could be somebody else's baby eagle. <laughs> like you just have no idea. So species ID, getting the photos um, is the biggest tool that we have. And you'll learn stages of development when it's okay to be out of the nest, when they should be. Um, common illnesses, whenever we keep you up to date on whatever, like the salmonella outbreak that we had this winter, mm -hmm. you know, we're in contact with you guys constantly to let you know what's coming down the pipe so you know. Um, and calls then you're going to be getting, yeah. Seasonal. So seasonal things, it's a lot slower in the winter on the calls and in the hospital than it is during the summer. Um, and we'll give you all of the local resources and stuff that you're going to need as well. Yeah. Um, so you'll learn a lot about something called capture myopathy and stress and um, capture um, handling and restraint is big. So walking somebody through how to pick up properly, pick up an animal. We're very, very lucky in Marin um, that we have the Marin Humane Society as our partner and they have an officer on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I don't know if everybody knows how insanely rare that is. We are so lucky to have that here in our county. But it's still only one very overworked person. It's still in one the entire case. county of Marin. And if they have to drive out to Bolinas to go get a hit by car deer, it could take them more than two hours to get to somebody in Nevada with a baby rabbit. So you are spending a lot of time on the phone. You are working someone through, A, getting them over their fear of touching animals, right? You have to get everyone past <laughs> that, getting them to wear proper PPE, proper protective equipment, wearing the right gloves, wearing the right eye protection in situations, whatever animals need that. But you are doing a lot of that. We are so lucky with Marine Humane. I still feel like I hear Barbara all the time going, okay, you're going to have to pick up that crow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And ideally, we want people to pick up the animal and bring them in themselves and save the officers from having to drive mm -hmm all over creation like if it's a safe animal we're not going to tell somebody to pick up a bobcat um although they do yeah they do <laughs> um yeah you have people who will put a bobcat in the trunk of their car and drive in and then you have people who won't pick up a baby bird like you just there's all sorts in between um rabies vector species is huge we'll talk about that because that's really important because if somebody gets bit um by a rabies vector species then we would have to euthanize that animal to have them tested for rabies and a rabies um, vector species does not mean an animal that actually has rabies. It's an animal of the species raccoons, skunks, foxes, bats, coyotes yep. that can carry rabies in our area. Yep. And you'll learn all about that. Yep. Um, and then a bunch of other special considerations by species. There's too many to list. Um, you're going to learn a lot about conflict resolution. So somebody who calls and says, there's raccoons nesting in my attic. If you don't come get them, I'm going to kill them. Mm -hmm. um, we will teach you how to de-escalate that and do the right thing for the animals and the homeowners. Um, but you do get calls like that. And so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to have this orientation is to, to talk about some of those things that, that make this job hard. Yeah. It is a challenging job. It is an incredibly rewarding job, but it is a challenging job. Guys, guys like that, or people, women like that, people of any <laughs> walk of life that make, that do things like that are going to absolutely put you to the test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and advocating compassion fatigue is something that we really want to work against. And so we try to be very supportive and, um, you know, have monthly meetings with everybody to talk about cases. You can always call Brenna, our volunteer coordinator. You can always talk to us med staff if you have particular cases that were hard or you're not sure if you're supposed to, what you were supposed to do. Um, we're going to pair everybody up. We'll talk about training in a bit. Um, but you will have a mentor that you're specifically paired with on your shifts um, while you're training. So that will help. Um, I don't know what she meant by the Bambi effect. So we're going to skip that. Past that, past that. <laughs> We're heading. We hit the next slide, but it didn't go out. So here we go. Why does she have the anatomy on there? I wonder. <laughs> I don't know. Learning how to pick up capture. Come on, buddy. It's learning capture and restraint. So oh, we squeeze a bird to death. Oh, and, yeah. So it can't breathe. Oh, and pelicans don't have nostrils. They don't have nares. Mm -hmm. So if you have a pelican, you have to keep the mouth open. Otherwise, yeah, don't ever squeeze a pelican's beak shut. Because you end <laughs> up suffocating. suffocating him. Why are we not advancing, I wonder? Sorry, our screen is not shifting here. Well, we can go on talking about uh, referring to other organizations. I'll keep talking if yep. you want to try to. Yep. Um, let's see. So what is next? 
Um, so the other thing that we will, you'll be learning about is all of the other organizations and ways that you can, um, or resources that you will have. There we go. There's a list of just a bunch in our area. Uh, we'll be doing, you, again, you'll be doing a lot of um, deflection. So mm -hmm. we don't want every animal to come here. So if it's a mammal from the East Bay, they have to go to Lindsay Wildlife because we don't want to risk spreading diseases um, and parasites here that might not have been here, all those types of things. Um, and again, we are so insanely lucky to live in the Bay Area where we have all these organizations. Mm -hmm. I started rehab in North Carolina 20 something years ago, and we were the only wildlife hospital other than the North Carolina Zoo at the time. So it was a potential that somebody who found an injured opossum would have to drive six hours across the state to bring us an animal. I bet they would. Some people would. Um, so we're very lucky to have us, um, Marine Humane, and then all of the surrounding groups that we partner with um, and work with. But we're one of the only that have, um, that answer our calls, our phones through the night. Um, Sonoma County Wildlife does, and I think that's it. Yeah. So people are so grateful to get a human mm -hmm. on the phone when they call. It's really nice. Yeah, often um, that's the first step is just being there as a person to listen to their stories. And, and I think that's one of the most compelling things about being on the E-line is hearing people's stories and letting them talk and letting them experience what they're experiencing and, and then helping them as you need to. I'm going to go back to this. Okay, one. shall we go to the next slide? Yeah. If we can, there we go. There we go. Work that time. All right, so common question that you guys would have is what kind of calls can you expect to get on the E-line? Obviously injured animals, hit by car, somebody found... Uh, just a bird with a broken wing, all sorts of it, um, different injuries. Um, so HBC is hit by car, CBC is caught by cat, caught by dog, FFN is fell from nest. Those are all abbreviations we use in the medical hospital. Obviously orphaned animals, um, a lot of conflict resolution. Um, sometimes people will call you for a patient update. And for some reason they call you at nine o'clock at night and want to know how the squirrel was that they brought in last week. And there are, so the we use that as an example of things that you don't have to deal with. So obviously you're going to be polite. Um, but you say, I'm so sorry, I don't have access to that information. This is the emergency line. I need to keep the line clear for emergency calls. Please call during business hours and they'll be happy to help you. Um, so it's okay to deflect calls like that. Um, obviously advice, um, they're going to call for hours and directions. Um, and then the nuisance wildlife calls that you'll be trained on how to, how to answer. Um, Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, so how many calls can you expect to get? It varies. We can't really answer that question um, with any certainty, of course. Um, but again, during baby season, they're usually 15-ish calls a night is pretty typical. So from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. is when you guys are on the phones. Um, during the winter, you can go a couple of weeks without one. Mm -hmm. um usually we get usually you get at least one a night um but in the winter the dead of winter we can go weeks without some calls um it's super busy so march and april is march and april is when the baby season just kind of starts but we are staffed in the hospital from nine to five we haven't gone to our extended hours so that tends to be the craziest busiest time because Spring babies are happening, but we're closing um, still at our normal time. And everybody gets out of work at five and they find the babies on the ground or whatever. Um, so those are super busy. And then once we go to our baby season hours where we're open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., um, the calls lessen because people can come bring animals to us later. Um, so you'll learn, you'll learn about our hours and when you can tell people to come and when they have to hold an animal after overnight. Yeah, I love one of the notes that we have on my notes here is that your number one goal is to help the person help the animal. You are the only two people who care about that animal in that moment and you can get it done. I love that. <laughs> yeah, she says that because there's a lot of people who are like, well, can't you just come get it? And I'm going to leave them out there. And no, I don't want to pick them up. Or no, I don't want to go get a box. And you're like, look, you're, you're, you're it. it. You're it. You are the animal's only hope at this point. Right. You have to do it. 
Um, that usually gets people up. It does. It kind of is. Like, we're in this together. And you always have to remember, they cared enough to call in the first place, even if they're being a jerk. It's <laughs> a really good point. Uh, the other note that we have on here is to always be polite. The One of these calls on here is the guy trying to pass the buck, trying to get um, the, hot, the hit by car owl. And always be polite. Never hang up on people, but you don't have to tolerate abusive language. Of course. So that's, uh, I, I, we're, we're ideally, and you'll see this on the application that we're going to have you fill out. We're looking for people that do have customer service experience. I was a concierge at the Ritz Carlton, so let me tell you, I'm good at dealing with abusive people. <laughs> and uh, it actually makes me terrible on the phones, though, because I'm not, I don't, I'm, my boundaries are not good. I'm always about like, sure, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. So that is something that you really have to learn. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we had to start some more. Why is my computer doing this? I swear. Hmm. Sorry, um, so some of the other um, questions and topics I think that people would need to know if you're considering doing this with us. Um, where did my notes page go? Um, let's see. You will never, you are not allowed to go on a rescue. So you are not going to be asked to go out and pick up an animal. You are not allowed to have somebody come to your house and bring an animal to you. Um, I recommend very highly that you do not give out your personal phone number, um, that you use the wild care connection that we're going to give you. Um, this is very much a phone support position. We don't want to risk the possibility of something horrible happening to you, um, you know, accidentally or on purpose that you go to somebody's house and you're never heard from again, or somebody comes to your house and is a scary person. Um, so just totally... You're just a wild care volunteer that is answering phones. You're not able to go anywhere um, to pick up animals. And again, in Marin, we're, it's not so bad because we have the Marin Humane Society officers. Where that gets really hard and where you feel bad, I speak for myself as being on call many nights, is somebody say in Berkeley. So Berkeley Animal Control closes at five and they're not open certain days. And so somebody is just across the bridge um, and maybe you even live in the East Bay and they have a baby squirrel that fell from the nest. It's like they have to hold that animal overnight and you'll give the, the tools on how to do that and they bring it to either us or Lindsay Wildlife in the morning. Um, so again, setting those expectations and knowing that setting boundaries. boundaries, we are not yeah. expecting you to be doing these rescues. In fact, you're not allowed to. So make yeah. sure make sure you've got that in your head that, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to drive to Richmond and pick up this opossum because no one else will. We just can't have you do it. Safety Your job lies or liability. To get lies. the person calling to take the next step mm -hmm. and save that animal's life. That is that is what your role is, and that is all your role is. But that's an amazing role that you're playing. Yep. And I think the other biggest thing is to just know when you don't know something. Yes. It is okay to say that. Mm -hmm. Just say, you know what? I'm so sorry. I don't know the answer to that. Let me call my supervisor or let me call my support person, and I will get right back to you. Please do not make things up. Um, and don't do your best guess because animals' lives are on the line. Um, and sometimes so are humans. You know, you don't want to send a human into the wrong situation. Yeah, just get out of your car on 101 and pick up that opossum and check for babies. Um, so yeah, so it's okay to say you don't know, um, especially in the beginning when you're training. And we know when volunteers start on the E-line, you have your mentor and we know that pretty much every single call you're going to be calling your mentor and saying okay what do I do what do I say I know I was trained on this but I'm not sure did I do that right um so you're not and you can always call people back that's something that yeah. I've done when I've been on call a lot of the time is I'll be I'll, I'll, I'll you know you know I need more information let me take down your I have your number here and that's when I call her of course mm -hmm. and uh, you can you can always call people back so you you feel kind of like you're pinned in that moment when they're on the phone but you can de-escalate and you can also you know pull in your resources by having that I'll call you back mm -hmm. you know I've got your number let me call you back yeah there we go okay so the next steps um if you are we'll open this up to questions in a minute um, but if you're still interested and you think this is something you want to do, we haven't scared you off, um, you will go online here to this, the link here and fill out the application. Um, we have I'm going to email this, by the way, as well. So everybody that is on the call here is going to get this email, so you'll have that link. Cool. Um, and then we will go through the applications and pick, you know, the 
folks who are the most qualified and available. And like we said, oh, we've we didn't it. talk about the um, requirement. Oh yeah, we should talk about requirements. Yeah, so sorry, I forgot. I skipped this part. So the, what we're asking for is a year commitment and what you would be on call one night, a, you know, a week. And obviously we know you have family events and hopefully now that COVID's doing its thing, vacations. You when everyone like else that. is going to Hawaii. Yes, mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, you all on the team will help cover each other. Like, hey, I'm going on vacation next week. Can someone take my shift and that kind of thing. So we do, you know, we know you're going to have breaks and vacations, um, but we do ask that it's minimal. If you know that, say, you're going to be out of the country for two months, then this is not going to be a good fit this round, maybe next year. Um, but yeah, so one shift, the five to nine shift a week as a minimum, if you wanted to do more than one, sure, mm -hmm. um, for, for basically a year. Um, We've had an overwhelming response. We've had a really, really good response to this volunteer opportunity. I think people are like, yeah, I'm sitting at home. I can pull that off. That sounds good. So uh, there is a possibility that we may have more than, um, have enough volunteers that you would have to not do every Tuesday evening. You would do, there's somebody who just hopped in late. Um, uh, welcome to our latecomers. This will be recorded. We'll have it on our website. So if you're coming in late, we can get you that link and, and that'll be on wildcares, discoverwildcare.org website. Uh, so we may be able to have, you know, every other week that you have your shift or, you know, something, something yeah. like that. So we're hoping that that, that will be a possibility. I I, obviously, the, the goal is to have a person on the phones answering phones for Wild wildcares emergency line from 5 to 9 p.m. Pacific time, seven days a week. And that's the goal. <laughs> So we'll have you fill out that application, and then the application has a couple of questions about your basically your customer service training. Like if you've been a, a, a 911 operator, yes, please, please do this job, please, please. Uh, so well, you know that sort of information. I feel like concierge should be a really good thing, but you have to have some boundaries. Um, the other thing too is not just call and customer service, but if you have good wildlife yeah, and not, that's knowledge, the other question. like species knowledge and things like that. Yeah, so those are both the questions on that application that will help us determine of the X number of applicants that we have who are the most qualified. And so, you know, you don't have to do what we do. You don't have to work for a wildlife hospital. You don't have to, you know, really have done any of it. I mean, having a lot of interest and customer service ability and being able to identify birds is like, you know, a great combination, a winning combination. So we do have a couple of trainings that we have scheduled coming up on the 20th of July and the 22nd of July. Those are two hour trainings. They will be recorded. So, um, but ideally you wanna do them live so you can have the interaction back and forth with our instructors. Cause we're gonna have several of our, uh, several, but we're gonna have a couple of our current E-line and hotline operators helping us with that training. So you're gonna be talking to people that are actually on the front lines the next step is answering, or I'm sorry, is purchasing a book. So there's no financial commitment at all for this volunteer orientation or experience. We don't have, uh, you know, we're not doing a training fee or anything like that. But there is a book that you need to have, and that is called Answering the Call of the Wild. It's through Toronto Wildlife. And again, I will email everybody with this link that the torontowildlifecenter.com, C-E-N-T-R-E, Canadians. Um, so the book is kind of expensive, and but it is an absolutely invaluable resource. And all of our, we had a little brief conversation with all of our existing Eli volunteers, and they're like, oh yeah, you have to have the book. You absolutely have to have the book. So we'll ask you to purchase that. Um, so you'll have done the training. You'll have read the book cover to cover. It's actually a really good read, I have to say. Uh, then we're going to have you take an exam. Very intimidating. I'm going to need to get that online. It's currently in a paper format, but we'll get it online. And uh, then, you know, sort of based on how everything goes and how you've done with your training, we'll put you up with a mentor and start you answering calls on a regular shift. Mm -hmm. um, and a few things that you can do to kind of prepare yourself for that, especially if you're not from the San Francisco Bay Area, totally fine. Just get yourself refreshed with the map. You know, we were talking about Berkeley. Berkeley's across the, across the bridge. It's on the other side of the bay. South San Francisco, you've got, so knowing the maps, knowing the species ID for the West Coast, and certainly what animals on the West Coast do as opposed to animals on the East Coast. I don't think it's that different. You've done it's both. It's pretty different. Um, yeah. That's the one downfall of the um, answer to call of the wild book is that there's different seasonal variations. Obviously, they have winter <laughs> and we don't. Um, and then some, like their species are, some of those species are different. Like they have Eastern cottontails that we do not have here. We have a completely different nesting mm -hmm. a nest with like five babies and a nest underground that mom hides as opposed to our jackrabbits who are 
out and about and precocial leave precocial. their babies in a hummock of grass and then walk away and you're yeah. like so no. there's some differences but in general the important information is the same mm -hmm. and uh yeah, I think um, open it up to questions. Yeah, I think we can open it up to questions. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see people. Um, let's see. Sorry, my eyes doesn't look like I. We haven't had any pop any questions pop up into the chat. Um, so does anybody you want to raise? Anyone want to raise your hand and have a question or unmute yourself and have a question? <laughs> I don't know, are we all totally overwhelmed or are we all thinking, yeah, that seems like something I could do. Like, how about some nods, some smiles, some like, oh, what hell to the no. <laughs> I feel like when the, when, the, when the opportunity was first presented to me, I used to do the 24 hour too. Um, oh, good question. What kind of logging calls do the volunteers do? And the short answer is not as much as they should. <laughs> um, it is our goal in every way, shape, or form to have all of those calls logged. Right now, people are just kind of keeping account of what they do, but I do think as a resource for each other, um, we need to come up with a better way to, to do that. So we right, have a form that you yeah. fill out for each call and just keep track because we like to do our annual statistics and find out how many calls you guys are dealing with every yep. night. Um, and then what, and it also helps us kind of figure out our training mm -hmm. and areas that we need to make sure you guys know what's happening. So the short answer is as much logging as you want to do. And ideally it'll be a little bit more organized by the time you get on. Um, I'm in Oregon, does that matter? No, Oregon, you're gonna have very, very similar uh, animals, very similar species, very similar situations. So Oregon is a, is a good location. The only thing with Oregon is if you're not from the Bay Area, it's mm -hmm. gonna take you a lot longer. It's gonna be a lot harder for you to know where to send people, yeah. like, you know, what's what's in our town, what do you call Marine Humane for versus, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's far away. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I have to say, if I didn't work at Wild Care, I wouldn't know the answer to those questions either. Right. So I think it, you could live down the street from Wild Care and still have no idea when you should call Marine Humane. Yeah. Um, do all marine mammals and birds go to the Marine Mammal Center? That is a great question. So yes, marine mammals, yes. So sea lions, seals, um, those guys go to MNC, but not birds. So they only do sea lions and seals um, and we, we get all the marine, uh, marine we get everybody birds. else. We get everybody else. Yep. So yeah, wild care. So we treat between three to 3,500, 4,000 animals every year. And it's about 200 different species that come in. So you are looking at all of the water birds, all of the songbirds, all of the raptors, the birds of prey. You're looking at all of your backyard mammals, your squirrels, your raccoons, your skunks. You're looking at bigger mammals, your coyotes, your bobcats. You're looking at- Don't forget the reptiles. The reptiles, the lizards. Yeah, yeah we, oh my gosh, we have gotten so many uh, tangled in garden netting snakes. The number of snakes that we've gotten in tangled in garden netting has just been astonishing. We've actually lizards, had to make an entire whole thing in our ward for the gopher snakes yeah. that we've never had to do before. We have we have snakes. It's kind of a COVID thing. We have like snakes. People were six, more. Yeah, six yep. aquariums high of snakes iPhone required. No, an iPhone is not required, but a smartphone is required yes. because we need to be able to forward the calls to your phone. Yes. And one thing that we are doing with oh, some of our, and the, one thing that we're doing with some of our volunteers, and I think we're probably going to get everybody on this system based on uh, how well you're, how good your reception is. So, so people that are, have good reception with this system are on it. And if you don't have good reception, we've been forwarding but uh, it's called 8 by 8 and it's the phone system that Wildcare has. It's a VOIP, voice over IP um, uh, telephone system, but you can text through it and basically you have the app on your phone. You log into 8 by 8 when you're on call. You're done with your on-call shift. You log out. You can text. You can have pictures sent through it. It's actually a pretty good system. So my and goal it goes through Wildcare's phone number, not correct, your personal exactly. phone number. Exactly, and it's, it's the specific number that the Wildcare hotline is associated with. So I'm hoping that I can get everybody on that again. The, the one consideration is how the reception is at your house, but I think 99% of people are making Yeah, that's able true. To do you it. have to have good cell reception at your house to do this. So it's like very you do. Point. <laughs> yeah, or be able to be willing on whatever night you're on to be somewhere else that has oh, good cell reception. Well, she just asked about a uh, oh, computer. Yeah. yeah. You, should, you can do that with the 8x8 app, absolutely. On a computer instead of a phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of our staff members actually, she's like, I'm gonna use my phone for this stuff. And I was like, all right, so you would need a headset that has a microphone. So whatever that means for your particular computer, but that is possible to do. So you would log into the 8x8 app. Actually, you could probably do it with speakerphone, but drive your friends, family, and pets completely nuts with speakerphone. But um, yeah, so that is definitely an option. So you don't actually need a cell phone as long as you have a computer that has audio uh, input. 
right. there's another question of how many volunteers are active yeah. at any one time. If you're asking about the e-line at night, it's just you. It's just the one person. But you have a mentor. In your mentor. But I mean, there's only one person answering calls. It's Correct. not like a call bank with a bunch That's of That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. It's funny. That's like, I'm like, we know that. Yeah. So it is, uh, it can get pretty busy. So you're, you're the, you're kind of the one lone voice in the, in the solitude. Yeah. It can get overwhelming mm -hmm. sometimes of like, you're on the phone and it's beeping because you have another call and then you call them back and it's beeping and you have another call. Like baby Jason, it's, it's busy. <laughs> it's busy, but you can call people back. Yep. You know, and uh, you know, five to nine, if you are someone that's like, I want to call that person back, you can call them at 905. Mm -hmm. But we don't want, again, with boundaries, I really think as a person that for many years had no boundaries at all, I was like, uh, concierge work does that to you. But I think it's really important to know what the boundaries are and stick within them. Mm -hmm. And if you are the type of person that can be incredibly empathetic, incredibly helpful, incredibly able to walk people through these situations and still take care of yourself, stay within the parameters of wild care and log yourself off at nine o'clock. And this is the job for you. If you're not that person and you're like, oh, I'm going to be on all night and this is not the job for you, it will kill you. <laughs> yeah, really we right, used but. to, we used to answer the phones from 5 p.m. through the night to 9 a.m. That was hard. It just got to be too much and having people willing to keep the phone on and by their bedside and answer it all through the night was too much. So I see another question that says, did we get a lot of calls during the fire and are there specific ways to deal with that? Um, honestly, we did not. Yeah. So that we are far enough away here. Have been. Have been, knock mm -hmm. on wood so far, um, that we did not. Um, honestly, there's not a lot of wildlife that goes to wildlife hospitals during these fires. They, yeah. they either make it or they don't. <laughs> Um, so there's very few that are rescued. Um, you do have animals fleeing the fire, and I oh, think yeah. that's definitely an issue. So you you may have, you know, if you end up with a, a big spike in animals running through people's yards and stuff, you would you would theoretically get additional calls about that. I think everybody who's close enough to be seeing that is so wrapped up in getting uh -huh. themselves and the like their own families yep. out, but it's not happening much. Uh, if you get an injured animal in the Los Angeles area, do you have facilities down there? So wild care does not. We are only located here, but we do have, there are great resources for wildlife care down in the Los Angeles area. So one of the primary resources that you're going to have is a huge list and also your friend Google of the wildlife care centers uh, across the country, but especially you know, if you're in the Los Angeles area, it's kind of a good thing to do some research on anyway, just find out what your local wildlife care center is, what your wildlife rehabilitation hospital is. I will tell you that the best thing, even if you don't do this, you should all right now download on your phone. It's a free app called yeah. Animal Help Now. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Rebecca Dimitrik started, we've worked with her closely um, and it's basically, you enter in your animal and what the situation is in your location and it automatically shows you all of the groups that are close to you that can help you with that specific situation. And it works for domestics, farm animals and wildlife. It's a fantastic resource for, I just, I always have it on my phone because mm -hmm. anytime I go anywhere, I find anything. So if I try to take a vacation or whatever, I'm like, just pop it in animal help now. And that's a really good resource. But it's not a live person. But it is not, a, not live a live person, person which but, is again the value of you on the e-line is mm -hmm. that a live that that live voice answering and helping somebody walk through yeah. their situation. Yeah, the, and there's facilities all over the country. There's individual um, wildlife rehabilitators. There's hospitals. There's vet hospitals that help animal control. It just will, you'll have the list. Um, that also. Um, usually each state has in their fish and game or fish and wildlife department on their website will have a list of all of the licensed rehabbers in their area. So you spend a lot of time on the phone saying, oh, where are you? And they'll say, I'm in, you know, Boise. And you're like, okay, what county is that? Because I see six different people listed for you. And then you give them that information. So it's it's very helpful to people. Yeah, it's funny. I hear the ladies on the hotline frequently saying, so what you want to do is you want to open up Google <laughs> and you want to type the words wildlife rehabilitation and the name of your town. Yep. People are like, oh. Yeah. So, you know, often it's, you know, just something as simple as, as that, helping somebody help themselves find what they need. Yeah. The farthest um, call I ever got was from Egypt. Yes, um, that was a good one. That was a really good one. One mm -hmm. night I got a call from a woman in Egypt who had an injured crow who had a broken wing. And the reason she knew about us was because her she was a reporter with NBC News and her son was a student at UC Berkeley. And so she called him and he's like, oh, call Wildcare. <laughs> 
I think we were having dinner. Yeah, I was like, wait, you're where? I don't know where you are. And we actually, I got on Google and started looking and we found her, um, there aren't wildlife hospitals where she is, but falconry is really big there. And we found a vet clinic that specialized in falconry and raptors, birds of prey. And she called them in the morning and they helped her with the crow. So you get some really cool and it's interesting because I, I feel like the same thing happens with, with IT, with computer stuff that, that you can Google something, but if you don't have any knowledge about it, it's, it's hard to know what you're Googling. Like, is that a good resource? Is that a bad resource? And I do feel like that is something that our e-line volunteers can really, really give people, you know, so let's Google this. Okay, this looks like a center that, you know, that, oh, it's probably just one person in her house that does rabbit foster care. Okay, so she's probably not going to be your option, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and then we have, wow, we have this amazing raptor center over here, and they'll be able to take that baby owl that you just found. So I think, you know, your knowledge really helps people through that search process. <laughs> Any other, Any other questions? This is fun. Okay. Um, the other thing that would be Jenny. good is um, if you guys email us um, any thoughts on this presentation of things that you thought were helpful or not helpful mm -hmm. or would have been helpful that would help us. <laughs> yeah. Jenny, you, you raised your hand. Did you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Sure. I was wondering if I'm using my cell phone and they want to send a photo of an animal they can't identify, for example, they can do that, send it to my number or how does that work? What we'll have you do is have you log into the 8x8 system, which has its own number. So basically I have 8x8 on my phone and I have my phone. So okay. when somebody calls me on my phone, it's green and red. When somebody calls me on 8x8, it's blue and red and they can text photos to that number. So that's been working really well. Uh, you can also have people text photos to the existing emergency line number. If, we, if you end up being one of those people that we have to forward the phone to you, to your line, have them text whatever it is to the emergency line phone number. And then that come, that gets forwarded as well. So it's a little bit of magic, but it does work. <laughs> so yes, again, we really want people to be very aware that you're not giving out your personal cell phone number. Right, you're not right personal address you're not you know putting yourself in that position because that's that's icky good question Anyone else? well all right well i very 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 much hope that we have some nodding and smiling faces which we're very grateful for i really really hope that you guys will be interested in in doing this opportunity it's it's not a huge commitment really i mean you know a few hours a week uh, to really, really make a huge difference. And let me tell you, you become either the most interesting or the most boring person at the party because you will be talking constantly <laughs> about animals, the things you've learned, the calls that you had, that person that you dealt with. It is really, really funny. And if you have friends, you know, I, I consider us, we, we are very lucky that all of our friends are wildlife people. So they love that stuff. If you have people that don't care about wildlife, they're going to be like, yeah, I shouldn't have signed up for that. Uh, You're going to learn so much, though. So I mean, it's much. Like, again, I've been over two decades and I still learn new stuff all the time, mm -hmm. which is why I still do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's exactly it. All right, you guys, uh, check out for an email. Uh, I will send that out. I might get it tonight or I might go have dinner. I'm not entirely sure. So it might happen in the morning. But this has been truly a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for staying with us. And we'll hopefully see all of you soon. Fill out the application. Yay! Thank Please you. Do. Thank you. Bye.